Okay, so uh, in the last class we were uh, discussing about whether a phase transition is possible at all, and uh, we had given a, an ar given an argument uh, in support of uh, the phase transition, which was based on comparison between the entropy versus the internal energy uh, in the free energy expression, and whenever uh, entropy dominates, you are in one phase, and whenever internal energy dominates, you are in the other phase. And that was some kind of a um, heuristic argument uh, supporting the phase transition in a system. Then after that, we talked about uh, impossibility of uh, phase transition, where we basically, particularly in the easing context, we utilize the time reversal symmetry of the model, which says that if you uh, swap the magnetic field uh, uh, sign or the direction of the magnetic field, then uh, you can show that under that swap, if, the, if you take all the spins to minus of itself, the part, uh, partition function is not affected. And as a result, the free energy is an even function of H. And if you study magnetization, then which is the derivative of free energy with respect to h, you would land up with uh, a function which of course would be an odd function because free energy is an even function. And then you find that m of h is equal to minus m of minus h, which would have concluded that m0 would have been 0. Okay, And we of course found a argument, counter argument to this, which is which is relying on the fact that we're going to actually take the thermodynamic limit. And when you take the thermodynamic limit, then your free energy may have discontinuities or cusp uh, at various places, and therefore the magnetization may be discontinuous uh, at, at a few points, okay? in this particular case, at one point, really. Uh, so the function is uh, well behaved almost everywhere but not everywhere. And the fact that it is not everywhere is the one which is relevant here. And what one finds is that del F by del H would take one value for H greater than zero and another value for H less than zero. And we kind of plotted it in a graph like this. Okay, so one would have expected that if the function is uh, differentiable, continuous and differentiable everywhere, then it would have looked like this blue graph. Uh, Whereas in the thermodynamic limit, in fact, it could develop some kind of non-analytic behavior. And that non-analyticity on, on in this particular case, even simple things like um, discontinuity of this type in the derivative of uh, free energy, which would just be a cusp, could lead to a non-trivial magnetization, even in the absence of external magnetic field. And having non-zero magnetization in the absence of external magnetic field would be interpreted as spontaneous magnetization of the system. And if that happens, then you would of course say that the system undergoes phase transition because in, there exists a phase, which is what which is called the paramagnetic phase in which there is no net magnetization. But then you find that you could be in a phase in which there is a spontaneous magnetization. And that is the phase which we call ferromagnetic phase. Okay, so that is the thing that we uh, argued last time. So the although the argument uh, saying that there, is, there cannot be any phase transition seems uh, seems to be valid most of the time, the problem which it uh, does not uh, take into account is that if you write down convex functions, then the convex functions uh, have the property that they are continuous and differentiable almost everywhere, but it doesn't say that it should be continuous and differentiable everywhere. And that is the uh, point which is responsible for these kind of non-energetic behavior of the system. Okay, so what we'll do now is basically uh, switch to a simple model first. Uh, but before that, I is there something we have just said that you can get spontaneous magnetization uh, if you take thermodynamic limit and if you take thermodynamic limit in a particular fashion. Okay, so thermodynamic limit of the system is, is uh, the limit in which you want to take n going to infinity, 
But if you take h going to zero first, then you may not land up with uh, spontaneous magnetization. So that is the non-commutativity of two limits is something which is responsible for spontaneous uh, symmetry breaking. Okay. Okay, so we'll uh, look at a simple model, which is of course exactly soluble, and it's called the one-dimensional easing model. Okay. Sir, uh, yes. Could yes. you tell me how how will we do it? How will we do it? Oh, what? First takes h tends to zero, and then takes n tends to infinity, and the second that, is that is right. So uh, yeah, so uh, good question. The point is the following that. Uh, you really don't take n going to infinity limit uh, in a realistic system because n equals infinity. I mean, like as uh, people, as one would can, one would easily imagine that even entire universe wouldn't have infinite number of particles. The number of particles is finite. But nevertheless, this is really a mathematical construct. Okay. Hello. Mm, yes. Yes. Yeah. We, it said uh, internet connection unstable, so I got a bit worried. Uh, yes, I should also say that, like, you know, my phone hasn't been working properly. So if the institute network goes, I will try to connect through my phone, but uh, the phone suddenly switches off, actually. So I am just hoping that nothing untoward happens uh, with HRA connection. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, so coming back to this point, this is really mathematical construct, uh, this thing. So, um, but uh, within mathematics, computation, they, you, one can show that these two limits do not commute. Uh, of course, experimentally, every system is a really finite system. And uh, what one could do is that one could uh, say that like, uh, even if number of particles in the system are very large, it is still finite. And one could, of course, ask a question, what is the finite size correction uh, to the bulk results that you obtain? And if you can show that the finite size correction is subleading compared to the bulk behavior, then thermodynamic limit is making sense. Okay, and that is how uh, one kind of evades this problem of physically trying to take n going to infinity limit. <clears throat> so there is, of course, you know, uh, reasonably large literature in taking into account finite size corrections <clears throat> and showing the, that the bulk behavior of the model is stable against the uh, against the boundary behavior of the system, okay. Uh, but I think we will not get into that. That is that is a subject on, in uh, of its own. Actually, it will take probably a semester long course. Uh, so yes, sir. Of these two limits, we yeah. are considering the second one, right? Like, that is right. Yeah. And so, are we going to be consistent with this in all other systems also? Yes, yes. We will always take uh, the thermodynamic limit first and then the external uh, stimuli are set to zero afterwards. Always. Okay. And uh, like if we like try and probe in into materials with, with like which we, in which we cannot justify taking the limit. Yeah. Then we won't like. Yes, you don't observe. Good point. Yeah. of anything. Yes. Yes, you don't get spontaneous magnetization. Suppose you look at like, you know, lattice with, uh, uh, say, three-dimensional lattice with like, you know, thousand uh, lattice points, you know, so uh, like 10 in each direction, okay? And you try to see whether the system actually uh, develops spontaneous magnetization, you will find that the boundary effects are uh, comparable and uh, they would destroy the spontaneous magnetization. So this has been observed in small systems where you can show that system doesn't develop magnetization. But as you kind of scale the system up, same iron, like, you know, take small iron uh, thing, like, you know, uh, something of the size of say micrometer length in all direction. That is like about, well, micrometer is still uh, about thousand in every direction, but still, if you take it something like that, that system is too small for it to kind of sustain the spontaneous magnetization. But if you take like, you know, 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 or something in each direction, then that 10 to the 8 cube is like about 10 to the 24. In that case, uh, the boundary effects are much uh, suppressed and the system actually shows magnetization. So there have been experiments who have explicitly demonstrated this. All right. Okay. Any other question?
Okay. So let's uh, start our discussion of 2D aging model. Oh, sorry, 1D aging model, excuse me. <clears throat> uh, so 1D aging model, of course, the Hamiltonian is same as what we had written earlier, namely h is equal to minus j si si plus 1 minus h si sum over all i's. Okay. So 1D aging model means just a chain of spins located at sites labeled by i. Okay. What we are going to do is use some method called transfer matrix method. Uh, I don't know whether you have already studied this or not. Uh, have you studied the transfer matrix methods anywhere? In StatMec or something? No, we are. You are not. Hmm? Okay. So maybe we'll, uh, at least in this model, it's kind of simple. So one can try to learn how to do that. Okay, and uh, but this has been a very useful method. A large class of models, two-dimensional models, have been shown to be exactly soluble using transfer matrix method. Okay, uh, in the one-dimensional case, it uh, looks very simple, but uh, still, it's a good idea to at least learn it in a trivial, well, not trivial, but in in a in a simple model. And uh, uh, there is a very nice book by Baxter. Uh, which studies a variety of integrable models in two dimensions using various kinds of transfer matrix uh, methods. You know, there's, there's a usual transfer matrix. There's something called corner, uh, something called corner transfer matrix and uh, stuff like that. He has developed various different techniques to study two dimensional systems. And uh, in fact, one has shown that there is an infinite class of models which can actually be shown to be integrable using this uh, this technique okay fine uh, so what we will do is we'll basically learn this technique in a model which is relatively simple okay we will study 2d easing model also uh, not today but uh, in the next class we'll hopefully start that uh, but i will not use transfer matrix method there i will use one more method so that in the process you will learn two different methods of solving okay so uh, just just a second, just hold on. Oh, yes, uh, sorry. Uh, so, um, yeah, so we will kind of uh, end up uh, learning two different techniques, one for a transfer matrix for 1D and uh, some other technique for 2D. Uh, this thing. Okay, so uh, fine. So what we want to study is of course a ferromagnetic interaction. So we are going to assume J positive and H is of course the external magnetic field. Okay, another thing that we will do is it's, it's a easing spin chain. So there are N lattice sites, but we will put periodic boundary condition. Okay. That means Nth site is interacting with the first site. Okay. So it's actually a closed chain. Okay. So that is uh, one more uh, choice that we are making. Now, of course, one can do various other things. One can choose free boundary condition. That means the first site is a boundary site, NH site is a boundary site, and you can just keep it uh, as boundary uh, spins and uh, allow them to fluctuate any which way they want without having any interaction on, on one side. Other side, of course, there's a lattice, okay? Uh, but we will uh, kind of stick to periodic boundary condition, okay? So uh, we will write down partition function using this <coughs> transfer matrix method. Okay, so let's define the uh, transfer matrix. Okay, so we define T S S prime uh, is equal to exponential of beta J S S prime plus beta H S. Okay, so, so T is a matrix, which is a function of two spins. Okay, and this quantity, if you really look at it, it just is a minus beta H. Okay, it's just that H is written with two minus signs sitting here minus in front of J minus in front of H. So minus beta H wouldn't have that minus sign. That's why these are plus quantities, okay? 
So nothing very great about this, right? As of now, okay. But you write down this matrix in this particular form, okay. So if you write down this thing, then you know that this quantity would have interaction. Uh, I mean, this quantity would have terms contributing whenever the spins are nearest neighbors, because that is the only place where the Hamiltonian is going to actually contribute, right? So therefore, this transfer matrix is non-trivial whenever S prime is a neighboring spin to S, okay? So in the 1D case, you have i talks to i minus 1 and i plus 1. But if you start in one particular direction, you if you write the spin i talks to i plus 1, i plus 1 talks to i plus 2, you have automatically taken care of all the interactions. Okay. So our partition function, uh, which is some or all possible configurations, uh, is basically just a product of this transfer matrix. Okay. So let's look at it this way. So T S1, S2, this is the interaction between S1 and S2, multiplied by T S2, S3, okay, and so on. So S1, S2 interaction is already taken care of. So only interaction S2 has now is with S3. Then you have a T S3, S4, dot, 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 all the way up to T S n minus one S n. And then because of the periodic boundary condition, we have one more term, which is T S n, S1, okay. Fine. But if you think of this as kind of a matrix object, then the this entire product is like a trace of nth power of t. Okay. Why? Because first element this. So you can think of this as a row uh, label and this as a column label of t. Then uh, you match the uh, row label of the first transfer matrix with the co column label of the last transfer matrix. If you do that, then you are actually taking a trace. Okay, so therefore, the partition function of the system is just a trace of nth power of the transfer matrix T. Okay, where n is, of course, the number of lattice sites that we are looking at. Okay, is that fine? I mean, uh, so yes. the elements. What is the T matrix? I mean, its elements are T S S prime. Yeah, yeah. So we will write down T matrix explicitly. Okay. Yeah. But as okay. of now, all I am trying to say is that your partition function is written as e to the minus beta uh, h, right? And yeah. that e to the minus beta h is just written in term, in the matrix form. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. And for every so, neighboring interaction, we have written it down. Yeah. Uh, so another question. Uh, there's a summation over uh, all the configurations, right? Yes. Over S1, S2, and yes. SN. So we will allow, uh, yeah, I have not written that because I have written T as a matrix. Okay. So matrix will contain all the configurations. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So we will allow all possible values. So think of it this way that S1 is like a, a, a column vector or row vector, actually, maybe a column vector. And uh, S2 is like a row vector. So if you take a column vector times a row vector, you get a matrix. Okay. But the column vector allows all possible values that S1 can take. In the easy model, of course, it takes only two values. So it's just a two by two matrix in our case. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Fine. So here's a actually I should have just scrolled down. That would have been easier. Okay. So here is the form of the transfer matrix. So if both spins, so just take one particular T. If both spins are up, okay, then we have a positive contribution for J and a positive contribution for H, okay. Contribution for H is coming from the first spin only, okay. Remember, it is written SI, SI plus one and SI, okay. So if you are looking at the first is T S1, S2, then here only what is S1 would contribute. We won't, don't worry about S2. S2 will contribute at the next, in the next transfer matrix. Okay, fine. So if both of them are up, then J would be positive. J has a positive coefficient and H has a positive coefficient. Okay. If both of them are uh, down, okay, then also you would have uh, J positive. Okay. But H would be negative. Okay. Because the i spin is down. Okay. The off diagonal fellows are one up and one down. 
okay uh, if the ith one is up and jth one is down okay then you get this expression because j has a negative coefficient and h has h continues to have positive because ith one is up okay whereas if ith one is down and j jth one is up then j has a negative contribution and h also has a negative contribution okay so this sums all possible configuration that s1 si and si plus 1 take or in this particular case you can look at just s1 and s2 so this is s1 up s1 down here s1 up and s1 down okay that is a kind of configuration we are looking at okay so now you can simplify this by pulling e to the beta j outside and you can write down this expression as e to the beta h is the minus beta 2j minus h is the minus beta 2j plus h and is the minus beta h okay fine so the first thing is that you can compute the two invariants of this uh, matrix one is the determinant okay so you can check that the determinant is 2 times sin hyperbolic beta j okay so that is uh, one thing you can check <clears throat> okay uh, the second thing is that the trace is e to the beta j times exponential beta h times plus exponential minus beta h but that is same as 2 times cos hyperbolic beta h okay so that is why this is a quantity okay now notice one important fact about this that this is a sin hyperbolic beta j uh, term which is positive why because beta is temper inverse temperature which is positive and j is already assumed to be positive we are studying ferromagnetic model okay so this quantity is positive trace is also positive because exponential beta j is a positive quantity and cos hyperbolic is always positive okay no matter what is the sign of magnetic field okay fine so once you know the for a 2 by 2 matrix if you know the determinant and trace you essentially know the eigen values right so you can just solve this problem the circular equation is basically uh, lambda squared minus trace of t times lambda Uh, plus determinant of t equals zero, okay, and the answer is this, okay, lambda is equal to uh, trace of t by two plus or minus square root of you know, is the same uh, discriminant t sitting around here in a quadratic equation, okay, fine. But we know what is trace of t, and we also know what is determinant of t, okay. So we just plug that stuff in and. Uh, kind of write down this expression okay uh, so uh, so notice one thing that you uh, uh, i should have written trace of t excuse me uh, yeah i seem to be having too many typos in my notes uh, although i keep correcting them they keep cropping up as i start uh, adding notes to that okay anyway so uh, this is supposed to be trace of t squared okay so we will use this exponential beta j times 2 times cos hyperbolic beta h at this location the two factor is not relevant it will cancel out out here and you get this expression okay uh, i have already collected one of the exponential 2 beta j from the determinant and added it to this expression to write down cos hyperbolic squared beta h minus 1 and the other piece is written explicitly the reason for doing this is you can replace this by sin hyperbolic squared beta h okay so these are the two eigen values that you get lambda plus with a plus sign lambda minus with a minus sign okay now you see one uh, thing that that these eigen values seems to have some square root sitting around inside it and you may think that this ex expression therefore has some kind of non analytic behavior but that is not true actually in spite of having this square root the quantity the discriminant sitting inside is always positive it doesn't change sign okay so therefore uh, this eigen value in spite of having square root does not actually develop any non non analytic behavior okay either uh, the either the beta j is positive sin hyperbolic squared is always positive and it is a minus beta j is also positive so there is nothing nothing interesting happening in the discriminant really okay fine but one thing of course is true that because this quantity is positive 
lambda plus is a larger eigen value and lambda minus is a smaller eigen value okay so that is something we would definitely know <clears throat> okay so now remember that we know the eigen values but the matrix looks like this okay and the matrix looks like this in the basis in which at every lattice site you have either spin up or spin down okay is that fine that is what we have used when when we computed one of the matrix you know in this particular form we said that we get exponential beta j because i h spin is up and i plus and one h spin is also up okay or we got minus because one of them is up and one of them is down something like that okay so we actually used up and down basis for determining the transfer matrix okay but as you can clearly see that the transfer matrix is not diagonal in the up and down basis okay but you can of course find the eigen values and by diagonalizing the matrix but clearly when you diagonalize the matrix okay and write down these eigen values as diagonal entries then the basis in which the transfer matrix is diagonal is clearly not up and down basis right it's kind of obvious because we have to do some similarity transformation and it will of course affect the basis vectors eigen vectors of the uh, of the transfer matrix uh, and they will change the form okay so suppose instead of up and down basis plus and minus is a correct basis okay now don't confuse this plus and minus with the up and down spin at all in fact you know it is not this plus and minus actually refers to the plus and minus uh, subscript of the eigen value lambda okay uh, they have nothing to do with actually spin value being plus and spin value being minus in fact it is not okay so but it makes it clear right here that it is this basis in which the transfer matrix is diagonal okay by that i mean that if you act transfer matrix on any one of the states of this kind say plus then you get a eigen value lambda plus okay but if you act transfer matrix on the state minus then you get eigen value lambda minus okay fine so uh, in the up down basis transfer matrix is not diagonal okay and the basis in which transfer matrix is diagonal up down uh, basis is not the correct basis okay instead of that plus minus is the correct basis okay fine now obviously the states uh, plus and minus are orthogonal that is kind of easy to see because if you uh, have transfer matrix acting on them giving different eigen values if you try to take overlap of that with respect to transfer matrix you will clearly see that they would give different answers okay the states would be orthogonal you can normalize them to make it also normal okay so once you make them also normal okay then you can use that to rewrite the transfer matrix in terms of these states okay so the diagonal form of the transfer matrix takes the following form there are just too many pluses and minuses but let me kind of run through it as bit slowly okay so the transfer matrix t is written as some kind of a projection operator on to the state plus okay with eigen value uh, with amplitude lambda plus okay i have deliberately sandwiched it in between just to kind of make one feel that like okay that this this is the kind of uh, object which can project a state to a plus state with a pro with the amplitude lambda plus okay i could have written it on the left also it doesn't really matter okay the other possible thing that you have is the orthogonal projection to minus state with eigen value lambda minus okay now if you take form of t to be this then and you act it on plus you can clearly see that you will get an answer lambda plus because uh, minus is orthogonal to plus so this piece is not going to contribute only this piece piece will click and since the state is orthonormal plus plus will just give you one and you get answer lambda plus times plus which is that okay similarly for lambda minus uh, you will get that answer okay identical process uh, the plus state would click minus state would click okay fine now actual partition function that we have written down is trace t to the n right but if you diagonalize t then t to the n 
is basically just nth power of the uh, diagonal entries, right? Because if you multiply diagonal matrix with itself, okay, you just square the entries in, on the diagonal, okay? So the life becomes simpler uh, suddenly because your transfer matrix is diagonal. If you look at t to the n, it is just plus lambda plus to the n plus plus minus lambda minus to the n minus. Okay, this is very easy to see. If you want to uh, check, do it for t squared. You just write down t like this and write t once again, and just take a product, and you will find that because plus and minus are orthogonal. Lambda plus lambda minus term wouldn't contribute. Okay, only term that will contribute is lambda plus with lambda per plus in the second one lambda minus with lambda minus. Okay, and because the states are also normal, whatever is left over is only lambda plus squared in the plus case and lambda minus squared in the minus case. Okay, by induction you can check that t to the n would give you this answer. Okay, for arbitrary n. Okay, is that fine? Okay, sir. Yeah. So, uh, so all of you are uh, following this one because this is a yeah. Sir, if T was not uh, symmetric already, then how would it be diagonalized? Uh, like, uh, if you are writing T as uh, plus lambda plus plus uh, in the uh, the second slide. Yeah, yeah. This one where you have written as uh, plus uh, cat lambda plus and plus bra. Yeah. And uh, the other minus sign, yeah. then it manifestly becomes uh, a symmetric matrix. And yeah, it in, manifestly uh, diagonal actually. What? Not just symmetric, yeah. diagonal. Uh, diagonal. And yeah. uh, since it is diagonal, it is also symmetric. Of course. Uh, so any transformation will uh, leave it symmetric. Yeah. And initially T was not symmetric. Initially T was, yeah. No, but like, why should every transformation leave it symmetric? You are just doing U transpose T U. Yeah. For some U. Yeah, but there's to, no. Uh, I have done this computation explicitly in front of you, right? You check the matrix is not di uh, symmetric, but uh, I can tell you that. You can diagonalize the you know, matrix. Right? It's like, you know, uh, I think I mean, you take say poly matrix sigma 2, which is minus i i. Okay, it is those are Hermitian, huh? those are still Hermitian, yeah. And so, like, if all the way uh, all the terms in the matrix are uh, uh, real, then uh, they are Hermitian, yeah. but T is not Hermitian here. No, why is T not Hermitian? Because uh, oh, T is no, T is not uh, Hermitian in the sense that like the entries are uh, of diagonal entries take different values. Yeah. Yeah. True. So it need not be diagonalizable. No, not necessarily. You need a normal matrix for diagonalization. Hermeticity is not important. The yeah, matrix, so it's the mean, matrix uh, is normal. Yeah. It is diagonalizable. It doesn't have to be symmetric either. So we'll have to check that uh, T is normal here. Yes, of course. But I have diagonalized it, so it must be the normal. <laughs> I'll have to check. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But like, you know, if if it was not normal, you couldn't have diagonalized it. So it's a kind yeah. of proof by no, con contradiction. Just found right? the eigenvalues. Yes. But if you find eigenvalues, that means it is diagonalized, no? Is it? Yeah, so this is proved by contradiction, right? If it was not normal, okay. you couldn't have diagonalized it, right? Okay. Okay. So fine. So what you find is that t to the n takes this uh, form, uh, which makes life much simpler now, because if you want to find out the partition function, you have to just take trace t to the n. Okay. Now trace is a, an interesting thing to do, do now, because trace means you just take First of all, you take capital N at power of this, which just means capital N at power here, okay? And trace means you just wrap around this stuff, okay? So the state plus goes with plus, giving you just one, and gives you answer lambda plus to the N, and similarly minus with minus, giving you answer lambda minus to the N, okay? So your partition exact partition function is just lambda plus to the N plus lambda minus to the N, okay?
fine. So now remember that we had uh, said this uh, some time ago that when you take thermodynamic limit of the system, then the ground state of the system uh, really is important. Okay, and uh, in this particular case, that would correspond to the highest eigenvalue, which is going to be important really. And so therefore, we pull lambda plus to the n outside and write down one plus lambda minus upon lambda plus to the n. Okay, now if you take uh, the limit n going to infinity. Then, since lambda minus upon lambda plus is less than one, uh, a quantity less than one to the very large power just gives you zero. Okay, and therefore your partition function essentially boils down to lambda plus to the n. Okay, in the n going to infinity limit. Okay. Hello. Okay, so if this is fine, then we can kind of compute free energy of the system. Okay, so we will keep n uh, large, but not take infinite limit for the time being. We can do it at some suitable point. Okay, so but once you know the partition function, you can compute free energy. That is just minus K B times the temperature times log of the partition function. Okay, when you take a log, then it is a log of this quantity. Plus log of that quantity. Okay, so you get n times log of lambda plus times K B T. Okay, with the minus sign coming from this formula, and a minus K B T times log of the remaining piece. Okay. Now, of course, in the thermodynamic limit, this quantity just vanishes simply because this would go to zero and log of one is zero. Okay, so therefore, this is kind of subleading thing for large sufficiently large and. <coughs> Okay. Okay, so this is the same thing that I just argued that lambda minus upon lambda plus is less than one, so you can take this to be one. Okay. Fine. So in the thermodynamic limit, therefore, you basically reduce your free energy to minus n times K B times T times log of lambda plus. Okay, and you can essentially forget about this piece. Okay, so of course I am still keeping the factor n here uh, because otherwise, like you know, whole thing would become infinite. Usually, what one writes is a free energy density, which is written as one over n times the free total free energy. That quantity is of course going to be finite. Okay, and the other thing which I had mentioned earlier itself that f is uh, analytic simply because lambda plus. Just go back. Lambda plus is a plus sign here is always positive, okay. And if it is always positive, then even if you have a log function, nothing untoward happens, okay, because the expression of lambda plus contains a square root, and the discriminant sitting inside is uh, is always positive, so therefore nothing special happens because of the square root. But uh, lambda plus is uh, manifestly positive, and therefore. In front, in, even if it is argument of log, nothing uh, special happens there either. Okay, so therefore f is actually an analytic function of j and h, which appears in the eigenvalue uh, here. Okay, fine. Okay, so uh, so the next thing that we would uh, want to do is to find out the average value of s. So that we can determine if there is a spontaneous magnetization or not. Okay, so that is one of the uh, thing that we would like to do in a in easing model in general. So in one D easing model, let's try to find out whether there is spontaneous magnetization or not. Okay, so S is of course sum over all the spins at I uh, at all sides and divided by one over n. Okay, so this is kind of normalized quantity, but Uh, remember our partition function, or rather our Hamiltonian. Just a sec. Yeah. 
So our Hamiltonian is like this. And therefore, if you want to get summation SI expectation value, all you have to do is to uh, differentiate with respect to H, okay? And uh, of course, e, you have e to the minus beta H sitting around there. So therefore, you kind of divide by beta also so that you can kind of get exactly SI pulled out, okay? Now, uh, you also have to just determine the expectation value with a normalized uh, form. So therefore, there's a one over Q sitting out here, which is the usual uh, thing that one does. So you can just think of this as a logarithmic derivative of uh, the partition function and uh, you can write this as 1 over n times beta times del del h of log of q okay but log of q is something we know because q is sorry q is lambda plus to the n okay so therefore log of q is just n times log of lambda plus okay so that's what we'll put here okay so this is just uh, 1 over beta times del del h of log of lambda plus. The factor of n, I just cancelled this factor of n out here. Okay. But this quantity is trivial. You could write that as 1 over beta lambda plus times del lambda plus by del h. Okay. So that is this quantity. Okay. Is that fine? Straightforward manip manipulation in some sense. All you have to do is to realize that when you put this h in the exponent, derivative with respect to h would bring out this point, bring down this quantity. Rest all just follows after that. Okay. Fine. So we want to know whether there is spontaneous magnetization or not. By that we mean that when you turn the magnetic external magnetic field off, is the kind of expectation value that we have just computed is that our expectation value non-zero or not okay that's what we want to know okay so for that we can always look at this expression and evaluate it for small magnetic field because anyway eventually you have to take the magnetic field to zero so you can kind of uh, look at small magnetic field remember lambda is a function of uh, uh, yeah it's right here uh, Lambda is a function of uh, h as well as j, uh, and there's a kind of uh, complicated form in some sense. But if you really look at it carefully, you will find that if you take h going to minus h, then lambda plus uh, does not change sign. Okay, because I mean lambda minus also doesn't change sign. So because all even functions are sitting around in the eigenvalue, cross hyperbolic beta h, so h going to minus h doesn't change sign. Sin hyperbolic beta h would have changed sign, but we have sin hyperbolic squared beta h. So therefore, it, that also doesn't change sign. Okay. So lambda is actually an, an even function of the uh, external magnetic field. Okay. So therefore, if you differentiate that with respect to uh, h, okay, it would be an odd function. Okay. So, but nevertheless, what we could do is that because it's an even function, you could just expand lambda around some value. Okay. And it will, of course, start directly with quadratic term, okay? Because the linear term cannot exist so by virtue of lambda plus being an even function of h, okay? Good. So if you write it in this form, then the magnetization, which is just the derivative of lambda plus with respect to h, would take this one of the h out, okay? And it will give you uh, a quantity, which is h, upon beta times lambda plus times this expression, okay? Fine. But you notice that there's a h sitting outside uh, and uh, because of that, you, uh, when you set h to zero, the magnetization is going to vanish, okay? This quantity is actually just, is independent of h because you differentiate lambda plus with respect to beta h and set h to zero. Okay, so therefore, whatever is the value that you get is some number really, which is independent of h. Okay, similarly here. Okay, so only h dependence was sitting around here in the Taylor expansion. After differentiating, you get a linear term, and it tells you that as h goes to zero, the magnetization would go to zero, and therefore there is no spontaneous magnetization at finite temperatures. Okay. Now, this is something which we had expected because we have already given this argument about how the uh, 
interface formation uh, was favored in one dimensional easing model and therefore the system would choose to uh, go into the disordered state rather than try to orient spins in the same direction because the entropy was always winning over the uh, internal energy okay so uh, and in this uh, transformative formalism we see this explicitly uh, because uh, for finite sorry for finite temperature uh, the magnetization is directly proportional to h for small h okay fine so um, but we can still ask what is the magnetic susceptibility and that would require us to ask how does the magnetization change as you change the external magnetic field okay uh, and of course that also requires you to turn on only small external magnetic field and see how the magnetization induced magnetization and not spontaneous one but the induced magnetization change uh, as you change the magnetic field well that formula is already here uh, there, and as i said this is just a number so we could kind of uh, forget about uh, uh, i mean we can just pull this number out differentiate m with respect to h would take this term out okay and you get an answer which is like this okay uh, i seem to be uh, seem to have missed up a beta locations uh, I, I i'll i'll correct this if there is a error in, in this okay uh, i may have to check uh, but uh, but it's okay i mean that the, the beta dependence is not so important what is important is really that it depends linearly on h and that therefore there is no spontaneous magnetization but i'll correct the formula in so okay so what you find is that the susceptibility of course is non zero it depends on how the eigen value depends on h uh, in the neighborhood of h equals zero okay so that is the susceptibility okay so the next thing that we would do okay but maybe before that any questions here okay uh, if there are no questions then let's try to compute the correlation functions okay so what we want to uh, do now is to compute spin spin correlation function okay which is what we used to call two point function uh, earlier okay it's just it's basically two point function of spin degrees of freedom okay and <clears throat> okay so the two point function is actually written like this gij is uh, uh, expectation value of si uh, with hj uh, minus the expectation value of si times the expectation value of hj okay so in other words <coughs> gi i mean in the quantum field theoretical language gij is what is called a connected uh, uh, two point function okay Uh, in other words if you look at this two point function this two point function itself could be disconnected piece expectation value of si times expectation value of hj okay when you compute a two point function like that it always contains a piece like this okay so what you do is that if you subtract that piece out then whatever remains is necessarily a, a connected piece okay because the disconnected piece has been subtracted out okay so we want to compute this quantity okay uh, so uh, and this is of course a two point function where which is the correlation between two spins introduced at site i and site j okay fine so what we will do is basically uh, compute this by using transfer matrix method okay now remember our partition function let's let me just put that up okay so our partition function is written like this <clears throat> okay so it is a product of all kinds of uh, transfer matrices depending upon spins defined at various uh, sites with of course in this particular case nearest neighbor interaction okay 
Now, <coughs> now if you want to compute a two-point function, then you need to insert this uh, spin in our computation uh, of partition function. Okay, so partition function is written in this fashion with no object inserted inside this. Okay, just product of transfer matrices. Now you want to compute two-point uh, function, then you insert this uh, uh, spin at appropriate place. Okay, so that's what we'll do now. Okay, so we say that we compute gij to be one over q times that is just setting the normalization that if there are no spins in inserted, the terms would just cancel and give you answer one. Okay, and then you write down the trace, which is what this uh, this uh, q is. Okay, uh, trace s t s one s two t s two s three dot 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 t s i minus one s i, and then you insert s i there. Okay, and then again you continue T S I S I plus one dot 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 T S J minus one S J, then introduce S J, and then again continue T S J S J times S J S J plus one dot 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 T S N S one. Okay, that is the periodic boundary condition. Okay, fine. So all we have done is we have written down the partition function and inserted the uh, spins. At the location where the spin would be sitting when you do this transfer matrix computation, okay. Is this point clear? Is this okay? Yes, it's okay. Okay. So, is this all? I mean, there should be other term, right? Which term? Uh, average of. Oh yeah, yeah. There is a disconnected piece. I have not written that piece, but we will oh, yes. subtract. We will subtract it. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. 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 No, of course. But like, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I have not written that piece. Should have. But when we'll do the final computation, we'll take that into account. Okay. Sure, sure. So I shouldn't call it GIG really, but uh, yeah. Yeah. So that is all my point was actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Maybe I'll correct this equation and write down that piece also. Okay. Uh, although you know, uh, yeah. Okay. I I'll just write down that piece as a formal expression. Okay. We will we'll worry about that expression later. Okay. Fine. So now what we'll do is. That remember the spin. Uh, this is the original form of the transfer matrix. We haven't done anything there. Okay. So what we'll do is that, like you know, the spin that you introduce, the spin that you introduce here can take two uh, values. Either it could be up or down or plus one or minus one value. Right. Okay. That is the that is how the Eisen spin is defined. So what we can do is we can replace the spin at site i by uh, poly matrix sigma three, where poly matrix sigma three has exactly same eigenvalues, one and minus one diagonally. Okay, is it fine? So to remember, this spin is actually a quantity which has two values, but t's are all matrices. Okay, so what we want to do is you want to give a representation of this spin in terms terms of another two by two matrix. And poly matrix is the matrix which would do the right job there. Okay, so we'll just introduce sigma three here and a sigma three here. Okay, so our G is going to look like this, uh, up to whatever Raman mentioned that I should have subtracted the disconnected piece. Okay, so all I have done is written the same stuff again, just replaced S I by sigma three and S J by sigma three. Okay, fine. Okay, so now the basis in which sigma three is diagonal was the basis of up spins and down spins, right? That's where the sigma three was giving us eigenvalues. Okay, that sigma three acting on spin would give you plus eigenvalue if the spin was up, minus eigenvalue when the spin was down. 
But precisely in that basis, we knew that our transfer matrix was not diagonal, right? Our transfer matrix was looking something like this in that basis, okay? So when you want to compute this quantity, you find that this entire set is not diagonal, this fellow is diagonal, then this entire set is not diagonal, then again diagonal, and then again entire set is not diagonal, okay? So, uh, so this doesn't seem like a very good uh, choice of uh, basis in which we would want to compute a two-point function, okay? So what we can do instead is uh, work in the basis in which the transfer matrix is diagonal, okay? So of course, to diagonalize transfer matrix, you'll have to do similarity transformation. And this similarity transformation would require you to introduce some, uh, you know, A, A dagger, sorry, A, A inverse between two transfer matrices, and then A, T, A inverse is a diagonalized matrix, okay? Uh, that is the kind of transformation that we'll do. But if you do that, then there, there are these two places where sigma three is sitting around the a, a inverse cannot be just cancelled, okay? So you have a, a sigma 3 A inverse here and A sigma 3 A inverse sitting here, okay? Those two quantities are the ones which are not going to be diagonal now, okay? And the reason why they are not going to be diagonal is because the new basis, which is what we call plus minus basis, in the plus minus basis, sigma 3 was not diagonal, okay? Because plus minus basis is a linear combination of up and down spins, okay? So what we'll do is that we will uh, work in the basis in which transfer matrix is diagonal and sigma three is not, but then we'll write down sigma three in the following form, okay? So, so since sigma three is not diagonal, it has plus plus state, plus minus, sorry, minus minus state, plus minus state and minus plus state, okay? The sigma plus plus, sigma minus minus, sigma plus minus, sigma minus plus, that all, all these are appearing are just numbers, really. They are not matrices anymore. Because this whole stuff is a matrix, actually. Plus plus is kind of first entry, minus minus is the kind of bottom right entry, and plus minus and minus plus are the off diagonal entries. Okay, so sigma three would look like this with these kind of entries. Okay, is that fine? Yeah. Okay. So now what we'll do is we'll use the diagonal version of the transfer matrix everywhere and substitute off diagonal versions of sigma three there. Okay. Now that is a relatively simple job to do. Okay. Fine. Now diagonal version of transfer matrix is something we have written down in a little kind of nicer form in terms of these uh, kind of uh, states, plus minus states. Okay. Sigma three is also written in terms of the same plus minus states, okay? So what we want to do is to compute uh, the, we want to compute the two point function using um, this kind of basis, okay? Now, uh, but before that, let's compute one point function because that is the one which will be required to, so that we can use that to subtract the quantity. Uh, Remember, S, one point function of S and one point function of SJ needs to be subtracted out, right? The product. So let's look at the one point function of SI. Okay. So one point function of SI would be something like this. Okay. Uh, so what we have done basically is that we have just introduced the uh, the spin at one location, and we want to ask what happens to the state when we look at the uh, when we introduce a spin at one location. Now imagine that you are in an ordered state, okay? By ordered state means, imagine you have like applied external magnetic field to get all the spins pointing up, okay? Well, I shouldn't call it all the spins pointing up, but I, I should say that, uh, I, that I have, okay. Uh, okay, let me argue it again. Uh, so what I want to compute is an expectation value of SI in the ground state, okay? So, the ground state with respect to these eigenvalues, okay, was lambda plus to the n, okay? That is the, the most dominant contribution to the partition function. So therefore, ground state would be lambda plus to the n, okay? To get lambda plus to the n as the answer for the ground state, it, it tells you that if you start from, forget about site i right now, if you start from site one, 
okay you would have all the uh, uh, states at site 1 2 3 everybody will be defined as a state plus okay if you have a state plus defined at site 1 site 2 site 3 dot 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 okay then you would get the eigen value lambda plus to the n that is how the ground state would look like okay now if you introduce a spin at ith site okay and you want to compute one point function then everything on the left of ith site is uh, is uh, uh, plus state everything on the right of ith spin is also plus state okay and you want to ask a question what is the state which is going to contribute when i introduce the spin there okay and you can check that you could have all kinds of terms written there but only sigma plus is going to contribute because that is the most dominant contribution okay so in the thermodynamic limit only con contribution comes from sigma plus plus sigma uh, minus minus is subleading because lambda minus upon lambda plus whole to the n is a quantity which is small okay so if you take thermodynamic limit for computing one point function the answer would turn out to be just sigma plus plus okay is that okay yeah okay so so but this quantity is the one which is going to con contribute to the magnetization so a local magnetization is given by just sigma plus plus okay total magnetization of course would require us to do a sum over all i's and check what is the value that you would get and that of course we have just seen that there is no spontaneous magnetization but locally of course there would be some magnetization and that value is just sigma plus plus okay so we just keep this in mind that one point function is sigma plus plus oh so yes isn't there a sort of a catch here because in uh, sigma 3 when we try to find sigma plus plus and sigma minus minus yeah in the basis in which t is diagonal yeah the matrix that changes sigma 3 to this uh, four element matrix yeah that is itself a function of lambda plus and lambda minuses that is right so yeah. like we are not sure at this point that which of these components contain which combination of lambda lambda plus and lambda minus yeah but that, that is not important i mean you are saying that lambda, sigma plus plus could be a function of lambda plus and lambda minus yes yes true but that is not important what is important is to which state it projects to right so for okay. example it's, it's not raised to the power n no? yeah it's not raised to the power n yeah otherwise like then of course you have to be to carefully analyze how what is the dependence okay yeah yeah okay so uh, now let us consider the two point function so what we'll do is that we'll again evaluate it uh, by taking the thermodynamic limit of the system uh, but we'll take the thermodynamic limit in the following way that we take n going becoming large but the sites at which the spins are introduced namely i h site and j h site the distance between those sites i minus j or j minus i that we will keep fixed okay so we are not scaling that okay so in between these two spins we don't in, uh, we don't kind of uh, inflate the uh, spin chain okay spin chain increases at the other locations okay that is how we are going to take the thermodynamic limit okay now as i said that we are computing the correlations in the ground state okay so therefore uh, we could kind of assume that uh, since the ground state is populated by the uh, plus states you can assume that all the spin states which are to the left of uh, i uh, site are all plus and all the states which are to the right of j h site are also all plus okay exactly the way i argued for the single spin we do the same thing with the with this uh, setup also so you have i h site and j h site so let's take i less than j okay then anything to the left of uh, i that means 1 2 3 dot, dot dot all the way up to i minus 1 they are all plus states okay then from j onward j plus 1 j plus 2 dot, dot dot all the way up to capital n they are also all plus states okay because that is how the ground state would be okay now we want to ask a question what happens between i and j state okay fine that case we have like you know two choices 
either you have states between i and j which are all plus again okay or you could have all the states in between which are minus okay so you have like semi infinite pluses uh, coming uh, all the way up to i well not semi infinite but like large number of pluses coming up to psi i then you may have finite number of uh, minuses and then semi infinite uh, pluses again okay or you have large number of pluses coming up to i after i up to j also you have plus and after j also you have plus okay the entire setup is like that okay so there are only two possibilities that you could have okay but but if that happens then if you look at the sigma matrix just a sec if you look at the sigma matrix then what sigma matrix will tell you is that either if if you if you cross i and you find that after crossing i the state remains plus okay then at the site i where you have introduced the spin the only operator that is going to click is sigma plus plus because it is going to transfer a plus state to a plus state across to a next transfer matrix okay is it fine yeah okay so and if it is transferring plus then j has no business to do anything because it has to give up sigma plus plus state to communicate with the remaining semi infinite pluses okay so therefore if you have a configuration which started with plus hit at i continue it as plus hit j and continue it as plus would have two sigma plus plus inserted one at location uh, i and one at location j okay so that is a quantity which is contributing sigma plus plus square okay is it making sense is this point clear so can you say it again okay so uh, maybe let me just yeah maybe this is not useful yeah so what i'm saying is that like you know suppose you have a site mm. okay let me look at that uh, let's stick to this okay so uh, so let's start like this we start from site 1 and go all the way up to i minus 1 okay because we are in the ground state all of them are actually plus states okay that you agree right yeah yeah okay now from j plus 1 to n also they are going to be plus states because we are in the ground state okay so majority states are basically uh, plus states only thing that we can see happening is between up site i and site j okay now when you hit site i okay at that location you encounter a of diagonal matrix okay up to the up to that point all transfer matrices are diagonal you suddenly hit a of diagonal matrix okay now you have two possibilities you have a plus state coming in from i minus 1 uh, position okay you could either return that as a plus state or you can return that as a minus state okay so suppose you kind of return that as a plus state that means i minus 1 is plus i is plus and i plus 1 is also plus then it is going to be plus all the way because after that the transfer matrix is diagonal and therefore it's going to be plus all the way up to j okay now at j again you have a choice but across j you know that the state is positive so therefore if the state is positive j minus 1th state is positive j plus 1th state is positive then j state has to be positive it doesn't have a choice okay and therefore if sigma plus plus clicks at ith state sigma plus plus would click click at j site also okay and therefore what you get is that if the entire chain is only plus 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 all over okay then you get a sigma plus plus squared contribution one sigma plus plus at i one sigma plus plus at j okay contrast yeah. that contrast that with the second possibility and that is that at ith side uh, instead of sigma plus plus clicking you have a sigma plus minus clicking if sigma plus minus clicks then 
the spin at site i actually swaps the configuration from plus state to minus state and then after that since the transfer matrix is diagonal i plus 1 i plus 2 i plus 3 dot 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 all of them are minus states until you hit j okay up to j minus 1 they are all minus states at j again you encounter off diagonal matrix but this off diagonal matrix sees a minus state on the left and a plus state on the right okay so therefore it has no choice but to have a uh, uh, have a state like this which talks to minus state on the left and a plus state on the right okay so therefore if i flips the spin from state spin state from plus to minus to sigma plus minus then j has to flip that spin state back to plus to sigma minus plus okay so therefore if the spin configuration was plus all over you get sigma plus plus square and if the spin configuration has a flip between i between i and j uh, sides then it would have a contribution sigma plus minus times sigma minus plus okay so that is how this is going to look like so our correlation function therefore looks like like this okay of which lambda plus to the n is just the partition function sitting in the denominator okay remember our correlation function are a partition function sitting in the denominator so that is that normalization piece then there are n minus j minus i which is same as n plus i minus j uh, lambda pluses which are all sitting outside okay to the left of i and to the right of j okay so those are all positive eigen values which are pulled out here between i and j you have two possibilities either sigma plus plus square clicks if that happens then inside fellows are also uh, positive states and they contribute lambda plus to the j minus i okay because that many sides are there on the other hand if the spin is flipped at i th side then you it will click sigma plus minus and then all through from i to j you will have lambda minus eigen value because spins are down uh, spins are minus okay and you have lambda minus eigen value to the j minus i because that many sides are there and then j would click sigma minus plus and after that all positive states uh would be connected nicely through sigma minus plus and all rest all contribution is already included here okay fine now this time around i have taken care of this si average times sj average piece here which is sigma plus plus squared subtracted but now you look at this expression and if you open the bracket then you find that lambda plus j minus i piece times lambda plus to the n minus i minus j piece just gives you lambda plus to the n okay that just cancels this lambda plus to the n and it gives you sigma plus plus squared okay but that sigma plus plus squared just cancels with this okay and what we find is that our two point function is just sigma plus minus square sorry sigma plus minus times sigma minus plus times lambda minus to the j minus i upon lambda plus to the j minus i why because nth power will go away and lambda plus to the i minus j in the numerator is same as lambda plus to j minus i in the denominator okay does that make sense yeah okay great okay so the disconnected pieces are already kind of removed and we land up with lambda minus upon lambda plus to the j minus i so that is the exact correlation function written in terms of the eigen values and the uh, components of the sigma 3 matrix is of diagonal representation okay now as i said that sigma plus plus sigma minus minus sigma plus minus and sigma minus plus which are these four entries sitting here are just numbers they are not poly matrices or anything okay uh, probably just a bad choice of notation but um, yeah this thing and other thing that we know is that lambda minus is less than lambda plus okay and because of that this quantity is smaller than one okay because j minus i is of course uh, minimally one is a positive quantity and therefore lambda minus upon lambda plus is 
yes. you are taking modulus of j and i j minus i it should be uh, yeah yeah I, should be, it should uh, be modulus of j minus i i have yeah. just assumed that j is larger than i actually yeah. Uh, but yeah, maybe I I'll just convert this into modulus, really. Okay. Uh, okay. I, mean, I implicitly assumed it somewhere, uh, hmm. but maybe I should. So I, I I need, to, yeah, there is no need to do that. I'll just put a modulus there. And that might be kind of safer thing to do. Okay. Yeah. So so is this uh, okay that we get exact uh, two point function taking this particular form? Okay. Now. Uh, let's de define the uh, quantity uh, one over xi, uh, and one over xi is defined as minus of log of uh, lambda minus upon lambda plus. Okay, so suppose you define this quantity, then you can write down this uh, two point function in the following form. Okay, so where c is just a constant. Okay. So uh, now notice that, like you know, if you write down one over xi to be minus log of this quantity, then uh, this minus sign would cancel this minus sign, and log j minus i times log of lambda minus upon lambda plus in the exponent is exactly this expression. Okay. In other words, you know, given any function, you can always write that as an exponential or something or other by introducing a log in the exponent. Okay, that's what we have done. Okay, fine. So we find that lambda plus and lambda minus are fixed quantities, right? Because they are they are fixed. Like J is fixed, H is fixed, uh, and if you are computing at a fixed temperature, then they are, these are just numbers, really. Okay, because lambda plus lambda minus are just functions of beta, H, and J. Okay, so. So therefore, this uh, quantity is just some kind of a number, okay. And what you see is that uh, the correlation function seems to fall off exponentially as a function of distance, okay. So the the fall off of the two point function is exponential in this particular case, okay. Fine. <clears throat> so in the in the last class we. Uh, Argued that not argued like uh, expression for uh, correlation function and one dimension was uh, proportional to log x, right? Yes. So uh, and here it is exponential. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so we will see that like you know this is a behavior. Uh, okay, I mean there is no contradiction with the uh, two things. I mean it's just uh, written in that uh, form. But uh, one can show that like this quantity actually is. Uh, uh, written in a correct set of variables would show the logarithmic behavior. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Next was only the distance, right? Sorry. Uh, distance between two points. Uh, in uh, distance between two points. Log yes. s. Yes. And yeah. j of j minus i corresponds to distance between two points. Distance between two points. Yeah, that is right. Yeah. So this, of course, is happening because you have some. Uh, external sources sitting around, which is kind of forcing the uh, decay to happen exponentially fast. Okay, so you can see how the decay would go away if you kind of look at the system where uh, if you take lambda plus is equal to lambda minus. Remember, if you take lambda plus is equal to lambda minus, that would correspond to setting some of the quantities equal and setting magnetic field to zero, temperature to zero, and so on. Okay. So in that case, you would uh, see the logarithmic behavior of the system. Okay. Is it okay? Yeah. So the correlation length goes like this. This is how we had defined it. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, Yeah. So, uh, if you want to really kind of check under which situation the correlation length would become infinite, because that is supposed to be one of the signatures of the transition. Okay. Uh, then we have already seen that the free energy is analytic, so there is no hope of getting anything uh, like a transition. But you can expect xi going to infinity uh, only if log becomes zero. Okay. 
and log could become zero only when lambda minus becomes lambda equal to lambda plus. Okay, right? Now such a thing would happen really at zero temperature because if you look at the oh, functional form, then lambda minus to be equal to lambda plus would require your disc discriminant to vanish. Okay, and the discriminant is essentially positive. Only place where it could act become zero is the uh, is when basically uh, the temperature goes to zero that is the only place where you could expect uh, something to happen okay so if you have lambda plus is equal to lambda minus what is the interpretation of that well remember lambda plus was the was the inner eigenvalue corresponding to the ground state lambda minus was eigenvalue corresponding to the excited state right so if lambda plus is equal to lambda minus then that is a point at which two levels are actually crossing okay so therefore only place where you could see possible transition is a transition of eigen values and in the transfer matrix formalism level crossing is a signature of uh, non analytic behavior or is a signature of uh, phase transition okay so therefore uh, if at all any phase transition would occur it would occur only when lambda minus is equal to lambda plus which corresponds to level crossing and that corresponds to this discriminant vanishing okay but even at beta in it does not va vanish no it vanishes if h is zero and beta is infinity then it vanishes oh, h is also zero. yeah h is also zero okay so only in such a situation would you actually hope to get that and but that is a zero temperature transition and at any non zero temperature you wouldn't see the system to uh, show any interesting behavior okay so uh, so that is the setup for one dimensional easy model okay so i think i'll stop here and next time we'll look at two dimensional system okay any questions